Okay, while we're waiting for more people to join, anyone has any questions so far about the class? Some people have concerns about uh, domination and the fact that we didn't cover this in lecture. So the, the definition of loops and domination will be in this lecture. So no worries. So you'll have all the, the right background to handle the assignments. Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, for the people who join later as usual, uh, remember you can ask questions both in chat or by muting yourself. And I would request for people who can, please turn on your cameras. That would be very helpful. Uh, hope at least some of you can do it so we have a more lively you know, environment for the class. It's a relatively small class, so it's okay to ask questions during the lecture using your voice. Okay, 
Thank you. Okay, so let's start. So uh, in the last lecture, we spent a substantial amount of time by showing you a few examples of the data flow problems. We went through two problems in uh, a lot of details. And today I'm gonna show you how uh, you can generalize things. Uh, that's gonna be mostly the first half of today's lecture. And the second half will be dedicated to uh, loops and uh, dominator trees, how to automatically find loops. Things you know probably informally, but never formally were probably working with, I would expect. So let's start. So remember, uh, we work on reaching definitions and live variables, and that's where we ended in the last lectures. And what we noticed is these two problems, despite being quite different in nature, can be formulated in a very uh, similar way. So for example, in, uh, in all cases, the word domain for reaching definition that was not surprising, a set of all possible definitions. For live variables, the set of all possible variables that can be live or not live. Then the equations for uh, those problems can be defined in somewhat similar way. There was a transfer function within an individual basic block, and that's the uh, mathematical equations for the transfer function for reaching definitions, having gen and kill set and the union. And here it was very simple, just using use and def sets, right? Uh, there was a meet operator. That meet operator was defining how I merge the information between two basic blocks, right? So it would explain me how the information from individual blocks can be propagated across all the basic blocks. Obviously, there's only one predecessor or successor that's trivial, you just copy it. But if there are multiple edges, there is a need to merge, and that's what the meet operator. In both cases, for reaching definitions and live variables, meet operator was uh, union. And then there were boundary conditions for in and out sets to solve these equations. So there were empty sets again, but it's not the only possibility as you see soon. And one pass was forward and another one was backward, right? So hopefully it gives you enough intuition that this thing, this type of analysis can be generalized. Why generalization is so important? Well, obviously the code repetition, I don't really want to write 10 different equations, 10 different ways to solve very similar problems. So I want to identify some generic framework that we will call data flow analysis. And that framework with a certain API can take these different problems and solve them in a uniform way. It's easy for you as a programmer. It's easy to code. You save a lot of time. And you will see that the data flow analysis we build is quite uniform. We're going to use it again and again, almost in every lecture. And even in today's lecture, we're going to use it for some problems. Okay, <clears throat> but before we would be so proud of what we build, we actually need to build this theory. So, um, um, so there's going to be quite, not a lot, but a little bit of theory in today's class. So bear with me. If you have questions, please ask, right? What we're going to cover is we're going to cover the math behind meet operator transfer functions. We're gonna cover the key aspects of analyzing the data flow problems, correctness. Obviously we want to make sure that whatever solution we get is correct, right? That's the first order concern. Then precision. So uh, answer can be correct by imprecise. For example, people might want to see how many live variables you have. You might re return some live variables, but some extra that might not be live, but that's more like a precision incorrectness. So if you call something as life, but it's actually not, it's not a big problem, right? It means you might uh, be conservative about these variables than you should be. But uh, the problem would be if something is life and you report it dead, because then it can be removed from the code, that would be a problem. So you would see the data flow problems can be sometimes not fully precise, they can be conservative. And then another important thing, if it's correct and you're clear about precision, how well they converge. It means whether we can argue that say for this graph, this algorithm would converge in certain number of steps, obviously an important property to know how uh, things work. And then we talk about their practical efficiency. So here there are some reference if you want to go deeper into that. Uh, most of the uh, you know, key results for data flow analysis were received 
uh, in 80s and beginning of 90s. So it's a relatively recent material in research, like in 90s that was state of the art, people published papers on data flow analysis. Okay, so let's talk about some definitions. So sorry, like a few next slides can be a little bit boring. There's gonna be a lot of definitions, but we need to go with them to, uh, to define things properly mathematically. First, uh, we need to define the domain. So the domain would be defined using a letter V, which stands for values. That's domain of all the inputs. Uh, as we showed before, that can be anything you would define, variables, definitions, expressions, anything can be a value, right? Then there is a meet operator that essentially identifies how, how taking values from the domain, two of them, generate a meet operator, right? And the initial values, we need to define those. And we need to define a set of transfer functions that transfer us from the one value into another value, right? So the usefulness I already talk about briefly, if we define a unified framework that uh, um, is helpful to answer a set of different problems such as correctness, precision, convergence, and speed of convergence for a family of problems, then we can dramatically reduce the design and implementation of all these analyses because we're gonna reuse a lot of code, right? So, Let's look at one of one, uh, one by one things. So I think domain is, uh, we're gonna talk about domain, but let's first talk about the meet operator. So we require the meet operator to be reasonably generic. We don't put too many restrictions to it, but some um, you know, useful properties are here. For example, it should be commutative. Like when I go on my control flow and want to do meet, I don't want to be worried about in which order I take right, those edges, right? I want to be flexible in which order because that's otherwise very painful. So it has to be commutative, right? So X meet Y equals Y meet X. Then it should be idempotent. So for example, X meet X equal X, right? So if we had two similar inputs, if they had a meet, they generate the same results. It should be associative, right? Again, we don't want to worry about the order, right? So that's an important to be able to have associative. Another thing we require from the meet operator, it should have a top element. The top element, essentially, you can think about the maximum possible input, right? There should be an element among the values that if I do a meet with any input, that would give you the input itself. Uh, um, so can you guys think about, say, for the problem of reaching definitions, what would be the top element? Something that if I meet with any input, I would get the same input. So what would be the top element for reaching definitions? The empty set. Uh, you're thinking the right direction, but you did it wrong, right? So it's not the empty set. Or if I'm like, sorry, I think I'm incorrect. You, uh, yeah, there are two possibilities here, but I think for reaching definitions, that there it's an empty set. For other things, it would be universal set. Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially a Z hand set. It's uh, uh, it's the empty for union, right? And it's a union for reaching definitions, right? And if you do an intersect, that's a universal set. Okay, that's two examples, right? Yeah, sorry about that. So this is just uh, uh, one example. There might be more complicated top elements. Then the meet operator defines a partial order on values, right? So if X is smaller than Y, it's if and only if that X meet Y equals to X, right? So this is essentially uh, what the, uh, you know, it's essentially, uh, defines the partial order and soon it will be clear why is it a partial order. Um, so uh, essentially it has the transitivity uh, property. So uh, if X is smaller than Y and Y is smaller than Z, then X is smaller than Z, right? So we won't be, to be we can't uh, uh, compare elements through the intermediate values, right? And uh, we had a property called anti-symmetry. So if x is smaller than y and one is smaller than x or equal, then x equal to y. So this is only possible 
uh, to be true if x is equal to y, and reflexivity, another simple property. So what is a uh, partial order? This is one of the most uh, simplest possible example I can do. For example, if your meet operator is an element wise mean, right? And you had a, a essentially a vector of two elements, then your top element would be two ones, right? That you can uh, say that that top element is bigger than one zero. It's uh, also bigger than zero one. And then you can have a bottom element actually that is two zeros. But you see why it's a partial order, right? These element and these element are not comparable, remember? You've seen this before probably in calculus and discrete math courses if you took them, that on multidimensional vectors, they not always can meaningfully compare them, right? That not everything is ordered. So this is another example of a so-called partial order. Okay, this is the simplest example I can think of. Any questions here? Okay. So this is what our meet operator is. As you can see, you can use different meet operator. It can be intersect or uh, uh, it can be union. Okay, so let's look some examples of the partial orders. For example, if you had uh, your domain consist of a pairwise, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of pairwise definitions d1, d2, right? So you have just two definitions in your vector that every value is a subset from all these possible pairs and say your meet operator would be an intersection, then the answer would be what I had in mind, which would be uh, t equals d1, d2. And then on the next layer, there would be individual d1, d2. And then the bottom element would be the empty set, okay? And if your meet operator is the union, then it would be the other way around. And you're gonna see that for region definitions, we're gonna get something like that, but there are gonna be other problem uh, where you're gonna get something like that, okay? In this particular case, we had both top and bottom elements. So uh, top element is such that, uh, as I said before, X meet T is X. And the bottom element is such that if you meet with it, you're going to get an empty set, right? Okay. Values and meet operator in a data flow problem define something called semi lattice. So uh, why it's called semi lattice is because we, by definition, we know we had uh, a top element, but it's not guaranteed to always have a bottom element. In most cases, you will have the bottom element, and we will see why soon. But there can be use cases where, uh, and lattices, semi lattices, where there's no bottom element, right? So this is why it's called semi lattice. Any questions about the definitions? I hope they were relatively straightforward. Now we're going to use it soon with some examples, but I hope the theory was more or less clear. And I show you some examples here. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, let's proceed. So uh, again, X and R are ordered if X is smaller than Y, which also means X meet uh, Y is equal to X. And well, if they are not ordered, there are like a lot of different possibilities can be, they can be, you know, uh, connected through some other elements, right? But otherwise uh, you cannot really order everything. Uh, uh, always. Okay, let's look at different examples of those lattices. So for example, one semi lattice for one variable is an intersection and it's a very trivial lattice. So it has one at the top, zero at the bottom, not particularly exciting, right? But that's what you get with just one variable. Then if you had a lattice of three variables, right? Uh, for definitions, then at the top, you're gonna have all three definitions, right? It's your top element, right? Um, uh, for example, and then you might have all the different vectors that are different from that one by just one dimension, right? So one zero in the middle, one zero at the end, one zero at the beginning. And then this is all smaller than this. And then there can be the ones with two zeros. And you see those had some partial orders. So you see, this element is smaller than this and this, but not that one. So these things 
are not necessarily comparable. So you see when you build this lattice and you get these layers in the graph, it doesn't mean that everything between the layers are not necessarily comparable. You can see it here, right, I hope. You can see that this guy is not comparable with this guy, right? None of them is larger or smaller because they're different in the critical dimension here. And then there is a bottom element here. So this is lattice of three variables uh, when you had intersection. Um, I'll, I think that in the definition we're gonna use, we need the, the top to exist. We always, in all the problems here, we're gonna always have the top to exist, right? Uh, you're probably right that you can do it the other way around and also divide the bottom element, right? And then the top might not exist, right? Uh, but here for simplicity, we'll always assume the top exists and the bottom might or might not exist. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. So uh, I'm a bit lost on uh, what the definition of a lattice is. So uh, do you have a concrete example on this? Yeah, so the examples are just in front of you. So this is a lattice, like you're looking at it. That's several examples of lattices. So lattice consists of values that are value domain. For example, if you had three variables, let's look at the right one side. You can see my mouse, right? This is for example, reaching definitions, right? So you see you start with an empty set and then you can have individual definitions and that all the pairwise combinations and then the, the whole set, right? If you had three. So what the lattice has, it defines the rules of order, partial order between the elements in this lattice and it defines an operator. So what you have, you have domain, which is uh, all possible combinations of three definitions, right? Those are your value vector. And then you had an operator that can compare them that something is less or equal than another element and not everything is ordered. So you cannot always say as in you know, natural numbers, which one is big or not, right? This is multi-dimensional features, right? And then the lattice is essentially the structure that you see with those rules. So that's the lattice. So mathematically it's the domain the partial order that we defined, right? And uh, the essentially uh, graphically for us, for humans, it's easier to think about lattice as this graphical representation. Does it answer your question? So this is, you see examples of lattices, right? Different lattices. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, and we start with the most simple ones, right? I'm not going to show you the most complicated first, but you get a feeling what it is, right? Again, remember, there's a top element that happened to be that that one also has a bottom element, right? And it has a partial order. So, for example, empty, you can have this order, you can have these elements are ordered, but say this guy and this guy are not really ordered with respect to each other, right? You cannot say which of these two is larger, okay? That's important to understand. So it doesn't have all possible errors. Okay, so why the hell we care about these lattices? As you start looking at them, you already start to see they have kind of a layering structure, right? They had like the top, then the next layer, then another layer, then another layer, right? Why is that important? It's important because we can define something called descending chain. And in the future, in this class, actually, you're going to see that that descending chain might be helpful to, uh, to, uh, to argue about convergence of the algorithms. Remember when I was doing reaching definitions and, uh, you know, live variables, I just informally said, well, do this, you know, until there are two iterations that are not different from each other. But it was very hand wavy on my end, right? I didn't prove you that it actually going to be a correct response, a correct output when you stop. I didn't prove that it cannot oscillate. What if it's going to flip flop to values, right? I never prove that. Informally, it was kind of clear, but I never prove it. The mechanism that will show us to say, you know what, and what I'm doing with algorithm is actually a solid strategy is descending chain mechanism. So what is the descending chain? This is the height of this lattice. So what the hate means is the largest number of relationships that will fit in a descending chain. So if you, for example, look at this thing, the longest possible chain I can have is like something like this, this, and this, right? So the hate is three, right? So 
Why is that important? Well, if I can argue that every step I improve in this descending chain, and I know this descending chain is finite, then I can say you how many iterations of my alg uh, algorithm would be needed in the worst case to converge, right? Because every single step in my algorithm I'm gonna improve, right, from the previous step. So the question for you, if I define a lattice for reaching definitions, what would be the height of that lattice? So you had reaching definitions, here you had it for three values. Imagine you had our general case with like n variables, right? What would be the height of the lattice for this reaching definition? The number of variables plus one. Yes, the number of variables is enough, right? So because even if it's one variable, it's one step. So just the height is the number of definitions. Is this clear to everyone? Wait, but for, for the previous one though, um, then, then couldn't you have a height of four? Because you have like the central line has like four elements. One, two, three. I don't know. It looks like three to me. Like, oh. do you have any path of four here? I don't see any four. There's also the top element, right? Wait, which one? The top element. Yeah, but I'm, I'm counting from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. If you take any path, it would be three, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So the big difference is just a constant, but it is actually precisely n in this case. Okay. So you see it's in some cases it's not that you know difficult. What is an important is that reaching definition has a finite descending chain. So the question is then had uh, is can we solve it's obviously if our problem is finite right? It la lattice has to be finite as well, right? Because of the definition, there's no circles there, right? There's no loops. So that those problems are clear. But the question, interesting question for you, can an infinite lattice have a finite descending chain? Is it important problems? Is, is there is a chance we can argue about the infinite size problem and argue they still converge? So the question for you, do you think it's possible or not possible? Remember the infinite, what, what infinite means is remember when I was thinking about the lattice, there is the width, that width can be infinite potentially, right? So this is a hint to you, right? Uh, I think you're looking in the wrong uh, directions here. So just think about something like natural numbers. Just think about the lattice for natural numbers. Anyone else want to think loud? Okay, count until three. So anyone wants to try? Well, the answer is yes. And uh, for example, uh, there is a couple of example. Like, let me just give you, imagine that we defined a lattice for something being constant or not a constant. So that lattice is gonna have top and bottom elements, is gonna have something at the top say undefined. Then in the middle, imagine this lattice that have just three layers, undefined, then a constant in the middle, but that constant has a specific value. It can be zero, one, minus one, two, and it can be infinite in both dimensions. And then at the bottom you had not a constant, right? So when, for example, you do constant propagation, constant analysis, you want to determine if a variable is a constant or not. That analysis is gonna have a very simple lattice that has just three layers in it. The height of this lattice is two, but the lattice values are actually infinite in both positive and negative dimensions. So you see that the, the fact that the problem is infinite in size doesn't mean it might not have a finite descending chain. It's important because it means I can do constant propagation analysis and argue about its convergence and finite number of steps, right? That's an important feature. Okay, so I hope I motivate you why this descending chain is important. Then let's look formally at other things. So we defined meet. How about the transfer functions? Remember when we were dealing with those basic blocks, we defined the transfer functions. So the transfer functions essentially is a classical function that defines from domain of values into the domain of values. 
It has a, an identity function. So there essentially exists an element such as f of x is equal to x for all x. And it's closed under composition. It means the composition of functions leads to the another function that belongs to the, the set of transfer functions. Why is it important? We want to build transfer by transfer and don't want to get out of our domain, right? So we want to be able to build up transfer functions in a nice way. Um, then after we define, so the transfer functions, you see it's very generic, right? In a sense, right? It, it's not really too many constraints on what the transfer can be. And then what's important for us, remember I talk about oscillation, right? If something is a constant fixed depth, right? In the algorithm, it's not enough to know that the height is fixed, but what is important to know that it don't go up and down, up and down. There is no like oscillation. So if I can actually have a framework where the function f is monotonous, it doesn't be required, but if I know it's monoton, then I can argue about convergence. And that's an important property here, monotonicity. Essentially, uh, it's what it means if, if x is smaller than y, then the transfer function would preserve this inequality, right? Um, another way to write it, you can think about it as essentially triangle uh, inequality, right? So the same is f is applied to the meet operator of x and y. It is less than transfer of x uh, meet transfer of y. Again, this is the best way to think about this triangle inequality, right? That's what it does. So if you merge input, then apply f, it's always smaller or equal then you apply transfers individually and then merge the results, okay? This is the requirement of monotonicity. And why is it important? Well, we want to check whether uh, what we did before, the transfer function we had before satisfies this property, right? Because if it does, and we know it has a finite descending chain, and it's monotonous, then the no oscillation is possible. It means that every step of the algorithm, I go down the lattice, right? Or up the lattice. And it means because it's monotonous, I always gonna hit either some solution or I'm gonna hit top or the bottom, right? I always gonna hit something, right? I'm gonna hit a constant solution where I don't move anymore, right? In this algorithm for this input, or I hit the top or the bottom, right? Which is a good property, right? It means, if I had the heat, I know that if I do uh, maximum number of steps I might have is the depth of my tree in my lattice, right? That's what's important. So let's check whether that intuition actually works for something like reaching definition. So essentially having a function f at x equals gen union x minus q and the meet operator is union. We just take the definition, right? And look at the first definition. So if x is smaller than x, y two, can we prove that, right? Uh, so, and that's actually, uh, you know, not that difficult because you can see that the gen set is the same. So, and there's a union and the kill set is the same. So since X is smaller than Y, this should be smaller than Y, right? So that's actually very easy from this to prove this, right? Because this is the same, this is the same. The only difference is this and union does preserve the, the results, right? So there's nothing that could, you know, uh, work against IU, IU because you can just start with this equation that do minus and then do union and that would be the conclusion. You can also do another definition this and if you do some set, you know, transformation, you will get that this is equivalent to this and essentially uh, that uh, proves there um, uh, that in both cases, this is monotonous, right? And this is our lattice for reaching definitions. Remember that monotonicity doesn't mean that f of x is smaller than x. There's nothing about that. Uh, so, uh, but the key thing here, the key takeaway is that if input of the second iteration is smaller than the input on the, uh, on the first iteration, that means that the result of the second iteration is smaller than the result of, uh, of the uh, first iteration, right? So this means if I keep removing some, you know, uh, or adding some definitions, right? Then 
my results always improving in one direction, right? Uh, depending on the forward or backward pass up or down, right? Is this clear at least intuitively to everyone? So why this works, right? So I show you that the height of the let certain lattices is finite, right? And that means they had a finite descending chain. And I show that if additionally I can prove monotonicity, then I know that uh, I can probably argue something about convergence, right? We're gonna do this a little bit more formally, but that already should give you a good intuition why this uh, algorithm works so far. Another important uh, property is distributivity. So essentially a framework is distributive if it only if f at x uh, meet y equals not less or equal, but precisely equal of x union of y. So if the merge is equal to the individual applications of the transfer functions, this framework uh, is called distributive. Uh, and it's not always true. So here's one example where something is not distributive. So don't think that everything is distributive. So for example, if you think about constant propagation, constant propagation is not distributive. Why is that? Well, here in this basic block, A is constant two, B is constant three. Here A is constant three, B is constant two. So it looks like A is constant here, A is constant here, but A is, is A gonna be a constant here, right? It's not, B is not being constant here. But more interesting, C might be a constant while it was not a constant along uh, like individual paths, right? Like you see, it might be possible that because A and B both change, that might be a constant on both paths, even though it was not a constant on the other path, right? So this is an interesting thing that you can see. So constant propagation is not distributive and it means it has certain properties, but not the others, okay? So I got you, you see the feeling not, not everything is necessarily equal because things we deal before was just distributive, right? But not everything is distributive necessarily. Okay, so I think we got all the basics done uh, to formally define the data flow analysis. So essentially, what, what it is, is essentially a, a set of transfer functions where each of these fu transfer functions is the functions defined for node i. And then uh, a transfer fp is a set of transfer functions where you had say a path from n1 to nk. So this is a path from node n1 to nk and this is its transfer function. Uh, and uh, fp just is an identity function if p has an empty path. Um, and then for that data flow analysis, we want for each node n, we want to look at all possible paths executed starting from the top element where we had like zero information, right? And the problem is that in this definition, that problem, if you just define it that way, it would be undecidable, right? Because it might depend on the input, right? And I don't I know all the possible paths. So it turns out in the most aggressive way the data flow defined, we might not give the answer all the time. It's a hard problem, right? So we might not leave, we might not uh, be able to leave with the perfect answer. Remember, I mentioned, I alluded to you already, you might need to live with a more conservative answer in some cases. What that conservative answer is, is a, is a called meet over pass. And there is many reasons uh, why it's, understandability is the most fundamental reason, complexity is another reason, right? Like imagine that if I had a lot of these hammocks, right, in my control flow graph, tracking each path separately would quickly become exponential complexity, right? So it is a very hard problem to deal with. So instead of trying to argue about all possible paths separately, what we do instead, we make an error in the conservative direction and we make a meet overall path. So what it means, uh, the path exists as long as there is an edge in the code. So it means if there is some path I can draw in my control flow, I assume this path is possible. 
it might not be possible in the real code, so I might be conservative, but uh, that assumptions let me simplify things dramatically. So it would allow me to consider more path cumulatively. And so I'm adding some solutions that are not, might not be real. So you will need to filter them out, but it makes my problem tractable. So the thing for you to remember is that it's not a perfect solution. It might have some redundancy. So it's more constrained. It's potentially more conservative, right? Uh, so it is still safe though, because it doesn't gonna lead to the situation. You're gonna make some conclusions, right? That would lead to the wrong results. So it's conservative, right? Uh, it can lead to some false positives, but it doesn't bring into any false negatives. Uh, so the ideal solution would be as close uh, to MOP as possible. That's what we are aiming for because anything else won't be necessarily super practical. So to make this a little bit less abstract to you, let me show you an example. So you feel the difference between ideal and meet over paths. We're gonna keep it MOP for, for simplicity. So imagine you have these if statements in the basic block. One is if x equals one, and another one if x equals zero. In reality, there's only two paths possible. You either go this way, right? Uh, basic one, basic two, and then you go uh, basic, uh, basic block four, and then B6, B7, right? This path is possible, and this path is possible, right? But you cannot be this path in reality, right? Because X cannot be both one and zero at the same time. But as you can understand, when I have a control flow, I don't have a knowledge of condition. That condition might be dependent in the input or hidden in some function. So I might not know what exactly path you're gonna take, right? So what the difference between MOP is that MOP considers the path that otherwise impossible in a real code. So it makes some conservative estimation. It might say certain things are possible when in the reality they're not, okay? For example, here we could assume that uh, it, it wouldn't be possible for you to say be in this block and this blocks at the same time, and that might devise you a more accurate solution. But in a mop, I cannot assume that. I had to assume that is possible. So is this guy clear? Uh, guys, clear to you? So for us, whatever we're going to try to build now. This is the best possible solution we can get. We cannot get better than that right now, okay? So if we can get close to that, that's pretty much we can get. And this is not ideal, but it's conservative. So the worst case, we not optimize something, but we're not gonna generate the wrong results. Okay, so we spend so much time defining these equations. At the end of the day, we need to solve them, right? Like those equations are there to be solved. So. Uh, for example, for reaching definitions, we get something like that. Output, uh, you know, output element assigned for empty sets. Values a subset of all definitions. Meet operator is union. And this is, uh, you know, uh, how we define the meet operators uh, for in and output. And then there's a transfer functions. And any solution satisfying the equations, a so-called fixed point solution, right? This is where we convert and don't progress. And Essentially, that's what we're looking at. And essentially, we had an iterative algorithm that initializes output to be empty. And if converges, it computes so-called maximum fixed point, which is the largest of all possible solutions to these equations. And what we know is that the fixed point is uh, more conservative than uh, maximum fixed point, And this is more conservative than MOP solution. So this is simple algorithms, can be reasonable, but not perfect. It's, it would be nice to make it as close as possible for MOP, but we might not always get it. Both uh, fixed point and maximum fixed points are safe. Remember, the more you go in this direction, less than perfect solution, it means your solutions is more conservative. Okay, so if the data flow framework is monotone, then if the algorithm converges, then we know that input of B is less than MOP of B. And you can relatively easily prove 
that statement by induction. Again, the interest of time, I'm not going to do that, uh, but it's a relatively easy thing. I will just apply the proof here. If you want, you can uh, look at it at home. It's just basically just use all the definitions on all the properties we have. You don't need to do anything. You just write the induction and apply uh, the definitions of all the functions. Nothing, uh, anything special needed here. So uh, what about precision? So this is where the distributive is interesting. So it turns out if your framework is distributive, right? Remember, that's why we hold this whole definition about distributive. Then if the algorithm converges, we actually achieve MLP of B, right? So we are not only be able to solve it with some conservative, but we actually can get the best we can under this problem setting, right? So this is why distribution is good, right? If you get our framework being distributive, that's a solution uh, and accurate. It doesn't mean that we cannot solve non-distributive problems, but the solutions may be more conservative. Uh, so if you had monotone, but not distributive, you behave as there is some additional pass otherwise. Okay. So what does the, uh, so we argued about how, if, if we always said, if it converges, then the answer is that good. But do we know it converges or not? So I already alluded to that, right? The finite descending chain and monotonicity together gives us the, uh, the convergence guarantees. So if the data flow framework is monotone and it converges, then that means there is a finite descending chain. So for each variable in and out P, we consider the sequence of variables across the iteration. And uh, then we just apply our monotonicity property, right? And we know that the second is monotonicity decreasing, right? That's the key prop uh, property here because it's in every step it improves, right? It's not getting any time worse. It might, it, it cannot oscillate, right? It means that it eventually converge and it means there's a finite descending chain. So that is good in terms of proof that convergence is there and to make a cap on how many iterations might be needed for the convergence. But as a system designer, we might not be happy with the theoretical result that it converges in linear time. We may actually worry about how quickly, is there a way to converge more quickly, right? Because the fact that the maximum number of steps is n, but if there is a way to do it in two steps rather than n steps, I would always pick the constant, right? Rather than the linear time. So there, okay. So the question here, does fixed point theory hold for the complete lattice? Um, that's a good question. I believe so. It's true as well. Um, so it would be actually probably even easier. <laughs> yeah, Albert is laughing here as a theoretician, right? It would be an easier problem. Yeah. So a speed of convergence. Uh, speed of convergence depends on the order. So, so far, remember when I talk about the problems, I didn't touch upon the graph itself, right? I assume any control flow you may have, right? And I didn't assume anything about the order. So essentially the algorithm was as great as no matter where I start, it would still converge, right? Just by design, it's always uh, converging. But it turns out if you want better performance, you may use some heuristics that depending on where you start, you may converge faster. So the order of the visits of the block matters. You can save yourself time uh, and efficiency of your algorithm if you take into account. So for example, reverse direction for the backward flow problems would be good. And uh, the other way around for, their, uh, for the forward back problem. So essentially, if your problem goes uh, forward direction, you want to start from the top to the bottom of the graph, that would be the fastest, right? Intuitively even. And if you do the backward problem, right? The, the reverse direction would be better because that's how the information propagate. Because otherwise, if you, uh, for the backward problem, you start from the top, you're gonna waste few iterations, not propagating any new information, right? You always want to propagate with some interesting information and the backward pass, it comes from the bottom of the control flow graph. So this is one approach to, to do it. It's called the reverse post order. Again, this is something well known in theory. Uh, this is just a heuristics that allows you to, uh, um, you know, to get a, a better 
to reduce the number of steps in your convergence. So in the first step, you just do depth first post order, right? Recursively across your graph. And uh, in the second step, you do just reverse order. You just go across the, the, you know, the post order that you get in the first step. And in this order, that's the, the order in what you want to visit the nodes, right? So if you just follow this simple algorithm, that would be a, an efficient heuristic to use. And again, here I just wrote down for you the algorithm on uh, depth first iterative algorithm for the forward pass, right? For the forward problem and how it would be implemented back in general. So this is using this reverse post order from the previous slide 21. Again, you can look at it. There's nothing fancy. I'm pretty sure you already, uh, in your theory classes, you look at you know, depth first post order and reverse orders. There's nothing uh, complicated here. And this reverse post order, you will then use an algorithm when you go through your uh, for your graph and looking for changes. But instead of go going through the nodes randomly, that's what we did before. Remember when we were doing reaching definitions and variable expression, I, I was picking those nodes pretty much at random, right, at my discretion. But this is still tells you the uh, more optimal order in which you want to take those nodes. Okay, um, so about the speed of conversion. So if cycles do not add information, the information can uh, only f uh, flow in one pass down a series of nodes of increasing order number. So essentially that's why the post order is helpful. Um, and essentially the passes are determined really by the number of the back edges. Because really if there's a straight flow of the information if there's no back edges, there's nothing new that can come in the next operation. You need to have a back edge, right? That would bring something new so there would be a need to go through these nodes again, right? So essentially uh, the number of iterations you might need to do if you do things right is the number of back edges in any acyclic uh, graph. And we define the number of back edges soon, right? Intuitively, you know what the back edge means probably already in the loop but I'll show you formally in the second hour. And so then the number of iterations is um, essentially this plus two and two is needed. So the constant two is just uh, a safety addition here because two is the minimal possible number needed just to show that two things not changing, right? If there are no loops, you need to do at least two iterations that prove things converge, right? So this is why it's plus two. It can be slightly better than plus two here. Okay, so this is the speed of convergence. So again, the now when you look at your graph and you do a rich in definitions, now you had the machinery. If someone questions your results, you can say, you know what? I had the whole theory behind me. I know that it's converging. I know how fast. And I can even tell you what the optimal strategy would be and how many iterations I need really to prove things, right? So by just looking at the graph, I can say, well, that have many back edges, so I don't need the more than three iterations or four iterations. Okay, so what is the depth of the graph? It's essentially the, it's a called depth of intervals for reducible graphs. Yeah, this is something that's a little bit sophisticated in most problems. It's uh, something around 2.75. That's something I cite from some old papers, uh, but that's a, probably still a good estimate. So let's do a quick check on the data flow problems. Remember, we defined something called semi-lattice, right? And I think there was a question here that I answered about what the lattice is. The best way to think about it is this visual thing that I show as a lattice and the rules about it. So it has a domain, a set of values. It has a meet operator that allows me to compare two values in this domain. It has top and bottom element uh -huh. and it had finite descending chain in some cases. It has a transfer functions that uh, transfer information for each basic block. We want it to be monotonous and otherwise we don't want to deal with this problem, at least I don't want to. And uh, if we're lucky, it's also distributive, right? Because then we know the solution we get is the best we can get, which is meet over paths or more. And algorithm, we had an association step for entry and exit and other nodes that's very straightforward. And then we define the good strategy, which is reverse post order, right? 
and the depth of the graph tells us about how quickly we can converge. So to conclude is um, in this, you know, last week lecture and today's first hour, I show you several examples of the data flow analysis, uh, reaching definitions and live variables. We'll learn about the generic uh, definition of the data flow analysis, meet operator, transfer functions. We argued about correctness, precision, and convergence, as well as efficiency of those mechanisms. And now, um, I mean, you would be lucky to try it out in reality, right? So that's one of your future assignments would be to implement the data flow analysis and then demonstrate it on a few problems, right? So you're gonna build this generic data flow yourself and then you're gonna demonstrate how it works on a few problems like reaching definitions, for example, okay? So everything we learned here, first of all, you're gonna see, we're gonna keep using it again and again in many different problems. Plus you're gonna actually try it out yourself, okay? Any questions here? Okay, I think we actually ended up perfectly at two. So uh, don't worry if you had more questions. I'm pretty sure when you start to implement these things, you're gonna get questions on Piazza, right? That, that's totally normal. Right now, I, I hope you get a right feeling that why, this, why the hell is you, this thing is useful, why you're learning it. Uh, and then you're gonna make your hands dirty and practice with this thing, right? And you're gonna actually see, uh, I didn't believe that data flow is cool until I actually implemented it myself and figure out that the same code now solves like 10 different problems, right? That, that was really cool about it. I just slightly changed my uh, input into my API function and then it just solves it, right? It's like the same code solves like all different problems. Okay. Then I think uh, we're done with this part of the lecture. The next part is called loops. So we're gonna talk about that in the second hour. So see you in 10 minutes, nine minutes.
Okay, guys, let's continue. And please turn on your cameras, especially the people who already did it before. Thanks. Okay, so before we move on, any questions about the data flow? I understand that you might not follow necessarily every line of proofs, but did you get the key ideas? Did you get the feeling? I have a question about one of the slides. Yes, sure, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. On the uh, on one of the solving data flow equations slide, yes. Uh, uh, under properties, you said uh, the fixed point was uh, less than equal to the MFP mm -hmm. and was less than equal to the MOP, which is less than equal to the perfect solution. Yes. But then we also said that um, the MLP is equals to like the perfect solutions with along with the solutions to an executed pass. So wouldn't that make MLPs greater than uh, or equal to the perfect solution? So what it means is that that specific statement, what it says that I might find some solution in MOP that's never possible. So it essentially means I would find a solution that I deal and then say, oh, there is this possible solution. And then it's not bad, but it never happens in practice. Right? Yeah. So that makes MLPs larger than the perfect solution. Well, the way we define larger is here, the small, it means more conservative, right? So it has some extra inputs. So the larger doesn't mean the size of the solution, it's the precision of the solution, right? Okay, all right, thank you. I okay, hope that explains it, yeah. So the best way to think about it is false positive and false negatives, right? Okay. The examples that everyone understands well, if you try to detect bugs, right? So there is, say you had a bug detection tool and there is the one that generates a lot of false alarms, but they were saying this is all a bug, but it's not really a bug. This is false positive, right? Because that reported to be a bug, but not really a bug in your code. That's a pain in the uh, hack because you know you would have the report and then you see and it's not real. And the people won't want to use the tool that has too many of those. But the worst scenario is you miss a bug, right? That it means that something was a bug and you reported it safe, right? Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, any other questions from anyone? Again, as usual, the slides and videos will all be available and you can look more careful into that, right? The proof is just to justify some of the steps you do and you will really learn it when you're gonna implement it. So then you're gonna really understand it. Okay. So let's move on. So loops, it's gonna be an interesting thing because pretty much everyone know what loops is. Nevertheless, if you formally ask about the loop definitions and show some examples, pretty much anyone is gonna make mistakes. So that's a very interesting thing. So let's talk about that. So what is really a loop? So the goal is in this part is to formally define a loop in graph theoretic terms from the control flow graph perspective uh, the one that is not sensitive to input syntax. So it doesn't matter, you use C, C++, assembly, Python, the loop is a loop. It represents the control flow. And we want to have a uniform treatment for all possible loops, do, while, go to, for, so it all doesn't matter. So we want to show something that's really the essence of the loop rather than the syntactic convenient form. That, that's the difference. So, um, so when you think about loops, you usually think about that constructs that programming languages give you. But this is really, um, I would fall, uh, I would say, um, an artifact on what the real loop is. And the way you write those loops is usually there just a matter of convenience, but that's not really a fundamental. So today we're gonna look at what fundamentally builds the loop. Because as you know, in assembly, you can just do the loops with go-tos only, and that's still loops, right? So <clears throat> one thing, so people usually think about loop is that something that have a back edge, like a cycle. One important thing to understand that not every cycle is a loop from an optimization perspective. So that would be a question to you now. So let's look at this very simple control flow graph. And the question I have for you, is this thing a loop or not? And there is another one like this. So let's look at the blue first. Is this a loop or not? Any opinions?
with control flow graph, you can actually write in assembly, for example. There is nothing. Oh, there's an on and on a sudden from the hand, no idea. <laughs> yeah, you guys have guesses, that's fine, but I want to have some intuition about your guesses. If you are not sure, like express what your concern is. Uh, I, I don't think it is because uh, you can get to C and D from B. Yes, any other like, opinions? So the loop doesn't start necessarily at A. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, or uh, someone says there's two entry points in, in this loop. Yeah. Uh, and this is the fact the correct answer. And this is the reasons why this is not a loop. And how about this thing? The right thing. Probably. Yeah. And the second one would be a loop. So as you can see, what's important from the optimization perspective to define something to be a loop is how many different entry points are in there. That's very important. So intuitive properties of the loop is a single entry point and edges must form at least one cycle, right? So that would build a loop. We're gonna formally define it now, but that's the key property we want. Why do you guys think I need this single entry point? Why I have this requirement? I'm just asking like people that define those, you know, uh, formal things, they try to be reasonable. So there was a reason why they did it. A hint to you, imagine you would have a, had to debug someone's code where someone, uh, makes a go-to in the middle of your loop. Yeah, so Dushan says, you, I think because you can't start halfway from a loop, um, I think the more correct way to say the same thing, you don't want to do it. You can, but that is a nightmare because you're gonna have half of the things set in this loop and others are not. So it's just a, a nightmare to think about what each variables are equal to when you're in the middle of the loop, right? So it's just not a convenient way to program. It would be painful. So people don't call the cycles a loop. So it might be a cycle, but it's not a loop, okay? So let's do a formal definition. So the formal definition would consist of a few steps. First, we're gonna define something called dominate and dominators. So we already talked about this entrance to the loop, but that was very informal, right? Uh, what is formal is uh, uh, the loop would depend on something called domination. What are dominators? The node D dominates node N in a graph, which is written as D dom N, and you're gonna see this a lot in compilers, if every path from the start node to N goes through D. So essentially a node dominates U if there is no way to escape you to reach that node, right? And as you can see, this thing would be very relevant when we try to define entry points into the loop, right? So this is what the domination needs, means. Dominator tree can be organized as a tree itself. So you start, you take a control flow graph as an input, which is a graph. And then the dominator tree is another graph, but that becomes a tree. So essentially every edge in the dominator tree, if A immediately dominates B. Uh, and immediately means you don't uh, look at the high up uh, dominator. So you, need, you take the, the, the edge only if this is the closest dominator in the control flow graph. So let's look at uh, that graph and try to look at domination again. I guess I'm not gonna make it too complicated for you, I'll just do it with you. So this is your original control flow graph, right? Let's look at a uh, dominator tree here. So as, as I told you, it's a tree. So when we're gonna look at node one, it doesn't have any predecessor. There's nothing else to dominate, right? There's no edges coming into one. Then for two, what is the dominator for two? That's easy, right? because though every pass to two goes through one, right? And it's an immediate dominator. So there is an edge from one to two in the dominator graph. Is this clear so far? Right? So how about five? 
why is five has a domination one? It has another edge coming from eight. Well, Shan said there is a direct edge to five. Yes, but that's not enough. You see, if it would be just one edge, that would be easy, but there is another edge here. Because you can go to five without go to eight. Yes. So essentially, the graph is done the way that I only can get to eight before I got to five. And, and to get, in order to get to five, I went through eight uh, to one. So it means that I anyway had to go through one. There was no, even if I get to five through this edge, I still has to go through one first, right? So this why this is no as interesting, right? It has two edges, but one is directly from one and another one cannot escape one either. Okay, I guess uh, uh, node four. So guys, look at node four. Why do you think it has the domination one? I think the star node basically dominates every other node in the country flow graph. Is it? Eh? True. But there could be the case like here, for example, six has five as a dominator. So the fact that one dominates everyone doesn't mean that it's immediate dominator, right? So the fact that there are paths going through one, that's one thing. But I guess let, let's put four aside for now. Let's look at node six. What is the dominator of node six? It's not node one, right? You can pick node five because it's not only every parse to six go through one, every parse to six go through five, right? You're trying to find the sets that, that the closest dominator, right? So for four, the answer is one, not because everything goes through one, but because there's one path that goes through here and one path that goes through here. And if you start to look at this thing, Three cannot be a dominator because there is a path through six that goes through five that goes through one. So there is a path that goes, that avoids two. And same story for two. If you try to pick six as a dominator or five, you would see there's another path here. So none of these nodes cannot be a dominator for this. And they ended up being just one. You see, right? It's, we're gonna do formally this, but I'm just trying to build your intuition here, right? You see, if like, you look at all the possible candidates as predecessors and you see they, they cannot dominate alone, right? Then that's what happens. How about node 12, right? Same story. You see there's one path from here. There's one path this way, this way. So it's ended up the 12, still only dominated by 11. But say node 11, right, is dominated by nine, right? Not by one. Okay, so this is what the dominance is, the dominance relationship. Why is, it important? Why is it very, very important? Because the dominance tell me, uh, it can guarantee me that before reaching this guy, I definitely reach through this guy. So if I want to set something that would be true for everything in node, I don't know, four, I know it's definitely gonna go through one. So if there is something common sub-expression or something I need to move out, I can put it here. So this is why the domination is so important. And the strict dominations are really uh, simple. So that's uh, here it's defined in this uh, property. Okay, so domination is important. We're gonna use it as a part of the uh, building the loops. Right now I didn't build you, tell you the algorithm how to efficiently build the dominator tree, but we will show you that, don't worry. So the next step is when you have domination, I want to define the single entry point, right? The single entry point is called the header of the loop. I'm pretty sure you've heard that before, one way or another. And the header essentially dominates all nodes in the loop. That's the property of the header. So this is one node in the loop that dominates uh, all the other loops. And then the back edge is an arc, an edge who, whose hat dominates its tail. So the way to think about the loop, there is uh, you know, the hat and the tail, and there's a back edge from the tail to the hat, and the hat has to dominate the tail, right? That's what builds the loop. So a back edge 
uh, might be a part, uh, part of at least one loop. So this is their definitions required to natural loops. We need a header, we need a back edge. And when we have a back edge, this by itself is might be not enough. So the natural loop of a back edge is the smallest set of nodes that includes the head and the tail for sure. So if there's a back edge, head and tail are definitely part of the loop. And also it includes all uh, nodes that has no predecessors outside of that set, except for the predecessors of the header. So essentially I start from the head and the tail, and then I start to recursively add all other nodes that has no predecessor outside of this set, except for head and tail. And I can add more and more nodes into the loop until I converge. And that builds the body of the loop. This construction guarantees that there is no side entrances in the loop because at any point of time, there are no predecessors outside of the set that's already dominated by the hat by construction. So I constructed the loop by having head and, uh, head and tail and head dominates the tail and everything else I recursively add into it would be always dominated up to either by head or something that head dominates indirectly, okay? So this is just the definition, but I give you the intuition behind this definition. So there is a header, the back edge, and the natural loop of a back edge. So let's look at the example here. So, uh, uh, for, uh, so essentially the steps we need to do is we first find the dominator relationships in the flow graph. Then when we get the dominators, we identify the back edges. And when we define the back edges, we find the natural loops associated with the back edges, right? So this is a three step to build so-called natural loops. They called natural because they had this good properties of domination. There are, can be some other loops that people can treat as loops, but usually for optimization, we want natural loops. Okay, so this is a three major step. Uh, I give you, I guess, the intuition behind everything, behind the dominator, behind the back edges, and be, uh, behind their, their loop body. But we need to make it formal. So first we need to do the dominators, right? So we need to formally find the dominators. Remember the definition? The definition is the, the uh, node D dominates node N in a graph so D dom N, if every path from the start node to N goes through D. And uh, we can formulate this as meet over path problem. So node D lies on all possible path reaching node N means the D doms N. So essentially the meet over path is a good definition here. So surprise, surprise, that problem can be solved as a data flow, right? And you're gonna help me now so we're gonna try and find with you uh, what should it be in terms of data flow problem. So we're gonna solve the dominator tree as a data flow problem, but to be a data flow problem, we need to answer all these questions. What is the direction? What are the values? So this is why I need your help. So let's first do the direction. So do you think the dominator problem would be forward or backward problem? And whatever you pick, try to at least justify why you think so. How is the information flows in this problem? I want to find that something goes from here to here, always flows through this node. Is it gonna be a forward or a backward pass? Forward flow or backward flow? Uh, I think it's forward because we have to consider like every path from the start node that's correct. Sorry, guys, I'm going to use abbreviation, but you get the correct answers in the slides. So don't worry, just forward. That's correct. So the next thing is, what are the values? So what is the what is this entities that we give as a values into the our algorithms? It's a very simple question. Just think about it. So what are the values? What do we apply this algorithm to? Just remember the previous slide. 
So what do we apply the, the not previous, but a few slides back when we talk about dominator, what's it applied to? Is it applied to instructions? Is it applied to branches? What does it apply to? I think Marvin, you're muted if you're trying to talk. Well, I, I think it's wrong, so that's why I'm not saying it. Okay. Anyone else want to at least guess what's the input here of the problem? Is it, is it basic blocks? Exactly. I don't know why it's taking that long. It's basic blocks. Like what else? There's no other inputs. It's just these abbreviations, DB, basic blocks. Okay. What do you think would be the meat operator here? You need to think about it like, uh, say, if I had a merge of two paths, right? What should I do? Should I union? Should I intersect? What should I do with the information as I merge? Intersect? Exactly. Because what happens if I had something to be a dominant on one inch and dominant on the other inch, it doesn't guarantee if it's not the same value, so it doesn't dominate, right? It needs to be something at the top of the both, right? I really want the intersection between the both paths, so it's an intersect. So what would be the, the top element in this? So it's a forward problem with the basic blocks and the meet operator that's an intersection. So what would be the top element? Empty set? No, all basic blocks. If it would be empty sets, we wouldn't go anywhere with intersection. We'll start with an empty and we would intersect with empty. So it's all basic blocks. The least precise, like the top elements are just all basic blocks. Okay, all basic blocks. So what would be the bottom element? The bottom element would be empty set. The dominator Deshanto would be the solution that we find. So there's a top element, bottom element, and if we do the through the algorithm and if we stack, that's your dominator set, right? but the bottom is the empty set. This is how deep to the bottom you can go. Okay. Then what be the boundary conditions here? It's a forward problem, right? So the boundary condition would be the out, the output, that's because in the forward problem that's output, on the entry node, on the entry node, would be just the entry node itself. It's very straightforward, nothing particularly useful. Then, then there's a need to, in, to initialize the internal nodes. So because that's a forward problem, you need to start from the output, output of the basic block. So what would you guys assign this to? This internal node, so we need to initialize it to something big because it's gonna then overlap. So what do we initialize it to when we don't have our no information? All basic blocks? Yeah, top, all basic blocks are top element. And then as we get more information, we would overlap it and it would become smaller, but we need to start with something big, which is a top element. The question for you, does it have a finite descending chain? What do you guys think? Would we able we would we be able to solve the dominator tree in a constant number of steps? And if yes, what would be that number of steps? Uh, yes. Yeah. Because the depths will be like the a number of the basic blocks. Exactly. We're not going to take longer than that. Sorry, sometimes it doesn't work. But hope we understand what I'm writing here. Number of basic blocks, right? And. The last but not the least, the transfer function. What is the transfer function here? So essentially f of, uh, so your input and the index that transfer function. It's a very simple transfer function here.
it's a union of what? Okay, I'll help you. So it's a union of the basic block when you enter it and the input X. So that's your transfer function. So if you build this generic framework, you can find the dominator trees using these equations, right? And we had all the proofs about the convergence of it. Right? Just out of a sudden, it helps. You're gonna see this thing gonna work in a lot of different cases, like it's gonna keep coming. Okay. Obviously, you need to practice and realize how to apply it, but you see it's not that difficult of a problem, really, to learn that. You'll quickly understand how it works. Okay. And the speed is, with the reverse post order, most flow graphs, reducible flow graphs, will convert in just one pass. Right. So it's going to be actually very fast getting the dominated tree. Uh, so uh, this is just the same thing here, so it's not very helpful this myself and uh, then this is an example of how it works. So this is your graph, right? The original control flow graph, this is your CFG. Okay. And this is how you iteratively run this algorithm. So start from, this is essentially your output conditions. Uh, it's essentially B union and you, you do the intersections across the old predecessors, right? That's just your input X, right? So because your X input is the all the predecessors, right? So remember when I, I wrote the transfer function that was, uh, you know, just the X. So this is essentially the X. It's very simple. You just, the output of one is just one. The output of two is one and two, right? Then you go for three and you get one and three and two is not in the sets because you had path from both here and here right so you didn't get two in here and then you get four which is get one three and four right and you do this across the whole graph just one pass and there's no change in second iteration so you just get this whole dominated tree in just one pass for most reducible graph that's what you're going to get it's very straightforward here you just take the node union, the intersection of all the output uh, uh, of the predecessors node of the outputs, right? That's it. Just need to start in the right order. Since it's a forward problem, it's relatively simple to start the right way. So this is uh, what you're gonna get. And this is how the dominator graph is gonna look like. Okay, the next step is to find the back edges, right? So we find the dominator trees. Now we need to find the back edges. So how we're gonna do it? We're gonna uh, build something called depth first spanning tree. So the edges traverse in a depth first search of the flow graph from a depth first spanning tree. So we start with a graph like that, right? And what we're gonna do, we're gonna traverse this graph in a depth first search order, right? And we're gonna categorize the edges uh, in uh, three major ways. The edge can be advanced in age, then it just goes from ancestor to the proper descendant. So that's an A H. Then there can be a cross edge that just goes from uh, right to left. And there can be a retreating edge. The edge from go from descendant to ancestors uh, and not necessarily proper. That's a retreat, so-called retreating edge. So what we're gonna do, and I just give you a second to look at it and ask me questions, is how I would I rank everything here? So let me just give you a few minutes to look, like a minute to look at it yourself and ask questions. I hope one to two is straightforward, right? You understand why this edge is A, right? It's a simple advancing edge, right? You just go from ancestor to a proper descendant. That's an A edge. Two to three is simple, right? Three to four, five is simple. Uh, and this edge is simple, right? Then you go in depth first order, then this edge goes here, right? And it's also proper one. But then this edge from here, 
uh, to here is actually not a proper descendant anymore, right? Because it's crossed, it's across the graph. So we already had the edge and this is not the, uh, the proper, like it's not the A edge because it goes through right to left in the depth first order. The depth first order would be this way, right? By the time you reach here, this becomes across edges. And then there are several edges that will be obviously going from, you know, lower number to higher number, so here, right? So those becomes retreating edges. So what you do is just go and color your graph with these three colors, advancing edge, cross edges, and retreating edges, okay? So, uh, so the question is why five to seven A, but six to seven C? So remember when you do depth first search from the flow graph, you go left first. So you're gonna go this way, then you're gonna go, uh, you know, depth, depth. So you're gonna depth first search, right? So you're gonna go all the way to here, right? And then only uh, by the time uh, you're gonna color this edge, you already have been here. So this edge already is not uh, the simple advancing edge because the simple advancing edge is only one here, right? So when you had an edge going from right to left, right, in this depth three, that becomes a cross edge because you already visited this node. So the first advancing node, so I have never been to this node, that's an advancing node, right? I go from one to two, from two to three, and here I go from two to four, from four to six, this is advancing edges, right? They simply go in the left order first, right? That's simply advancing. But when in the graph I already had a node that was visited and there's another edge that comes into it, but that edge is not a retreating edge, then it only can be a cross edge. Yes. So you had either advancing edge or retreating edge or the cross edge. And the best way to think about the cross edge, because I always pick the priority go left first, that it looks like going from right to left in the graph, right? It crosses the graph. That's why it's called cross edges. I didn't come up with the notation. Is that the people in the graph theory come up with the notation? But that's essentially the three edges. You only have three types here, right? You go through the depth first analysis. You mark all the A edges first, you get some retreating edges, and then you get the rest is across edges. So what is the back edges? So the back edge that usually uh, identified as T to H is uh, the edge that goes from tail to header and head has to dominate the tail. So uh, you got these retreating edges those retreating edges are candidates to become back edges, but not every retreating edge is a back edge, right? So these uh, purple or reddish uh, retreating edge is our candidates to become the back edges. Most of them will be back edges, but not every single one, okay? So this is why we do this uh, back edge analysis. So we perform a depth first search that for each retreating edge, right? So here we found the retreating edge. Then we look at the dominator tree and say, would this guy dominate this guy? And if it is, then it's a back edge. That's it, okay? So the way you do it, you take the graph, you color into three colors, you get some retreat edges. And for every retreat edges, you check dominator tree, right? And we just learned how to look at, the, uh, how to build dominator tree. And if it turns out that, uh, the tail, uh, uh, if the hat is in dominator's uh, least of their uh, of their tail, then that's it. That means it's uh, a, a back edge. Most programs, all structured codes, most go-tos have reducible flow graphs, which means retreating edge literally equal to back edges. So in most proper programs, retreating edge equals to back edges. But you can write, and I'll show you examples of go to code where it's not true. But in most cases, retreating edge means a back edge, right? That's why you need domination. Okay. And this is an example of this graph. This is a non reducible flow graph for which 
it's not actually clear what the tail on the head is and what the entrance would be. And it's possible to generate the code like that. Not particularly pleasant graph, but it's possible to write this code, right? So that's a non-reducible flow graph. Okay, so here for your own practice at home, I'm showing some examples. That would be your original graph. This is how you're gonna color it. Uh, I didn't show the advancing edges, but that's essentially the your retreating edges, uh, right? The, uh, they all ended up being your back edges. This is your dominator tree, right, for convenience. So whenever you're going to look for each of this age, you, for example, this one, this is nine, this is one. You're going to just look whether one dominates nine. It is, so it means that's a proper back edge, right? And here that would be true for every retreating edge. So we're gonna have that many packages. Remember that the package doesn't mean by itself doesn't create a loop. There are gonna be some complications here you're gonna see, but this is how we found what is a proper package. Any questions here? So it's not straightforward. It's not in one step, but each step towards this goal is now simple, right? You took the graph, you color it in three colors, and then you found your retreating edges, and then you get your dominator tree that you learned how to build in the previous pass, and then you just check. And in most cases, this retreating edge becomes your back edge. Uh, may I ask a question? So, so um, why is two to three a uh, cross edge? Because I, because because if you do that first, or you go one, two, three, and then you keep going down to reach a leaf node, right? Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, so I think two to three should, should be an advancing edge. So I think here it was the graph was uh, just traversed in this order, right? Because when you go which direction to go, um, it doesn't actually matter that much. You can just rot like imagine you would rotate it, right? So it's it okay. won't change anything, right? It just it just happens to go depth for search in this order, where we built this example and they copy pasted it, right? It doesn't really matter that much. As you probably notice, cross edges doesn't really affect themselves anything. They just cannot be called advancing edges, right? Uh, so just to distinguish, right? But yeah. I see. So most uh, so so multiple um, answers are possible. Yeah, yeah, it's just you go, uh, you do a depth first search, right? And depending on which order you decided to go, there would be different colorings. But you see the advancing versus across edges doesn't affect because we're looking for retreating edges, right? So that's what matters. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you, you get retreating edges, right, the, the rest doesn't matter. It's a nice sketch, but it, I mean, it doesn't change anything, right? So you can just play with it and do di different depth first searches, right? Like on this graph here, there's one way to do it. The first search go into two first, or you can do it this way. Okay, but the dominator tree is the same for both, right? Any questions? Okay, so we're getting close, right? We get dominator tree concept. We already find what the back edge. Now for this back edge, we need to find all the content that belongs to this back edge. And that is called the natural loop of a back edge. It is the smallest set of nodes that includes the head, a tail of the back edge, and has no predecessors outside the set, except for the predecessor of the header. It's a very long definition, I agree, but let's try to play with it. So essentially what the algorithm that would uh, work for that. What, what you do is that you take a node uh, H, right, your header, and delete it from the flow graph. Then you find those nodes that can reach tail, right? Those nodes that can reach tail now without the hat, are, are those are the nodes plus the header that forms the loop. So you literally take the hat, right? You remove it and look at everything else that can still reach the body of the loop, right? Without the hat. And that uh, those nodes form the, the natural loop of of t. So because that's the uh, that's essentially a very simple algorithm just based, based on the definition, right? Because what you want, you want something that has no predecessor outside of the set, except for the predecessor of the header, right? So you 
you really just find those nodes that can reach T, right? And uh, you just need to make sure that it has no predecessor outside of the set, that's it. So it's a very simple algorithm. And uh, there is a question on how uh, we deal with multiple loops because unfortunately we don't have just small loops here and there. We have loops that can be nested or overlap. So how to deal with that? So if two loops doesn't have the same header, then they either disjoint. So I mean, one loop, another loop, the loops are, you know, uh, completely disjoint or one is entirely contained nested within the other one. So the loops, they cannot be like partially overlap. That's the whole point, right? They either this way or this way, right? So one loop is entirely contained nested within the other one. And there is one that's called inner loop, one uh, that contains no other loops. So one loop can have multiple inner loops. You can have one loop and then there's one loop there, another loop there. Each of them would be called the inner loop because there's no other uh, loop there. The inner loops are important because they are the hottest. They tend to be executed the most. Usually you try to optimize these loops first, right? Because they had the most number of, you know, iterations done overall. Um, here is, uh, so everything else with the proper loops is easy. Here's uh, specifically tricky examples for you. What if two loops share the same header? So the previous one says two loops do not have the same header, but what if I had two loops that share the same header? So what if I get this situation? Which one is inner, which one is not? Which is the outer loop? How to define loop here? So what if you get something like that? So I think you agree that this is a retreating edge and the back edge, this is retreating edge, here's a back edge, right? So both, this is a loop and this is a loop and they share the header. Uh, maybe you could um, create a D, like a, like a node D where B and C both go into D. Yeah, you are thinking in the right direction, Robert. So essentially, in this case, it's hard to say which one is the inner loop, right? So what usually people do, they combine this as one whole blown loop with two back edges and slightly reform it, right? You can add like an extra pre-header there, but that's essentially what you do with the loops like that, you just combine them, right? All the other loops that get used to do, to work with, like for a while and everything, they all look nice and nested. They're not tricky, right? They're all nicely reducible graphs. Okay, so they won't generate you any hustle. So if in a properly written C++ program or C program with LLVM, you're not gonna get these weird loops normally. You need to write an assembly to get something like that. Okay, so um, there's another thing that's important for loops that's called pre-header. So you already had the headers, right? This is the loop, this is the node that dominates the tail. But it's sometimes very convenient to find a node before the loop where we can move everything, right? So we know that uh, every path into the, the loop that goes through pre-header first, because you're gonna do things like loop invariant code motion, common, common sub-expression elimination, you want to move it into some convenient place. So pre-header is an artificial node that's created just before the header. In the control flow, you create like an empty block called it pre-header, and that makes the header with only one edge, right? So it really allows you uh, uh, to easily optimize things. You know that the header has only one edge, right? And that makes moving some uh, variables uh, or expression outside of the loop is easier. So this is what pre-header is. It's not required, it's an artificially created node. Its sole purpose is to simplify different optimizations. So the summary of what we did today uh, on that, you know, hour, we defined the loops in graph theoretic terms. So hopefully now you know what the loop is, formally speaking. And we found an algorithm uh, consists of three major steps to, be, uh, to find the loops. Uh, honestly speaking, every compiler you're gonna work with already knows how to find loops. So this is mostly for you, not for the compiler help so that you understand how those loops were found and how they defined. So LVM already had an interface to find all the loops, right, in the code. But the, if you ever need to build it yourself in your own own compiler, you know that you need three steps. 
First, you build the dominator tree, and we have an algorithm on how to build the dominator tree using our favorite data flow analysis. Then we get the back edges. We do this by coloring the graph in the depth first order and getting advancing, retreating, and uh, cross edges. And then most of the retreating edges becomes the back edges based on the domination relationship between the head and the tail of the back edge or retreating edge. And then having this back edge, I add all the nodes uh, that would build the body of that loop by simply removing the head from the graph and looking what ever, uh, looking at everything that can reach the tail now. Okay. Okay. I understand that my, there are still some questions for some of these algorithms, why they work, for example, natural loops. You should probably play with them and look at them. Like there are a lot of definitions were done in a way to make it simple. For example, there is a reason by construction why it's so simple to add elements of the loop body, right? Because they make sure that head has dominated everything, right? The tail. So there's no side entrances into the tail. So the minute I remove the head, right? The only thing that can reach the tail is the thing within the loop because outside of the loop, they cannot go into the tail. Then the head wouldn't be the dominant, right? So it means that everything external to the loop that was possible to reach the tail now cannot reach the tail anymore, right? Because the head is removed from the graph. So only the things that were already reachable within the loop that will stay. I hope that intuitive definition shows you. But yeah, everything is optimized. So you just magically do something and it just works. I don't think it's that easy from the beginning. So people thought about it. So they make it as simple as possible. So, but yeah, it's really cool. I believe that the fact that you, in order to find the loop bodies, you just remove one, one node from the graph and then that's it. You, you have the whole loop body, right? It's just a constant time algorithm, right? You don't need to recursively look at what would be possible to reach the tail, right? It's already done by the dominator construction, right? Nothing can reach you already. So I know that it might not sound intuitive, but if you play with it, you'll get it. Any questions? Okay, that's it for today. I think it's the first time we finished on time perfectly and cover all the material I want to have. So it's, I guess I'm getting used to the right speed here. I have this lecture. So, okay, any questions? Uh, may I ask a question before I go? How do how do break and continuous statements work in this case? Yeah, remember the break and continuous statements are really not something that exists in the IR, right? Your IR at the end of the intermediate representation in the compiler gonna convert everything into go-to statements. There is nothing like continuum break. That's that's all just access. So essentially your continuous statement is gonna be and probably a go-to if it's conditional with the next statement outside of the loop. This is exit from the loop. But remember there is continue, it's just a regular go-to outside of the loop. There is nothing special about it, right? So it's gonna be the edge that going outside of the loop, right? So it's, it's not. So any, any of that is just go-to. There is like, if you think about it, at the end of the day, every, any construct you get used to using the loop, they had to be converted into the go-to statements, if branches and if statements and go-tos. There's nothing else in assembly. No break and continue in assembly. Yeah. Okay. 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 And all the nice loops that you get to use to for do while while do, they all be converted into this format. They're all gonna look identical at the end. Right. Yeah, it's ab abstraction, right? It's a convenient abstraction for you to write to make your life simpler, but for the hardware, there's no need in that. This is like syntactic thing, right? Like a certain person, like there is a preference. Some people like write loops in a certain way, others in a different way. Someone likes for loops, someone runs while loops, right? Uh, but this is all syntactic preference. Like all any loop can be written with a different loop instead, right? They're all equivalent. Okay. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, it, as usual, if there are questions for assignment or classes, please post them on the Piazza. Okay, see you next week. Bye.